This is the Get Global Young Professionals Talk Global Health Podcast, envisioned and created by the Irish Global Health Network and their student outreach team. I am your host, Megan Davis, communications and events intern at the Irish Global Health Network and second year medical student at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. In this series, join me and my student outreach team co-host Aidan Desjardins, a microbiology student at Trinity College, as we talk to inspiring young professionals leading the charge in their respective fields, often operating in sidelines to their career, following their passions above all. Today, we are excited to welcome Eunice Phillip. Eunice is a healthcare professional with over 10 years of experience in emergency nursing, childhood immunization care, and reducing stigma in tuberculosis and HIV care in West Africa. Here's a segment from our conversation. You know, if it's just saving one, you're making a difference. So it's not until you do this big thing. It could be something as small as that. It's actually an act of kindness. The Sustainable Development Goals, to me, is wrapped in kindness. You know, show kindness to somebody. You are improving their mental health. Eunice is currently a Global Health PhD researcher with the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland and also serves as a Global Health guest lecturer on the undergraduate public health module at the University College of Cork and on the STAND Educational Development Program. She was awarded the Jacqueline Horgan for Bronze Medal Award from the Royal Academy of Medicine Ireland in 2018 for her research on household air pollution from cooking fuel and anemia in women and children in six sub-Saharan African countries. Welcome to the podcast, Eunice. Thank you, Aiden. That's excellent. It's great to have you guys as well. Thank you. <laughs> So we'd like to start by asking our guests how they started in their field. So how did you get involved in global health? To be honest, health related topic has always been somewhere in my life, you know, from my parents deciding that I would be a medical doctor when I'm older to volunteering with the Red Cross Society in high school um, back in Nigeria. But looking back now, um, there has always been that pull towards health and well-being. However, the actual call into public and global health was owned during my nursing career as an emergency nurse in Nigeria. Um, I was also involved within that period in childhood immunization, HIV, and TB care. And within those periods, there was this glaring disparities in health among my patients due to whether they were from a rich family or from a poor family or from which part of the country they were. And I knew there was something wrong there. Like, why should I treat this patient differently from this other patient? Um, I think the most glaring example for me was childhood immunization, where you have one child born into this affluent family, and the child is happy out with complete immunization, you know, records and traveling around the world. And then there is this child from a low income com- uh, family that's struggling to actually make it to an overcrowded health center for their first dose of vaccine, just because they can't afford the rich hospital. And you see this across the HIV and the tuberculosis treatment centers, you know, where I work. And these were my light bulb moments that there could not be a reasonable justification that where I was born or my economic status should be the judge and the jury of my rights to good health, well-being, and to life. So this conviction is what has underpinned my public and global health work. And I would say that's actually where it all started. Like, I just can't find the balance between these disparities. So, um, yeah. We understand that your current research is focused on implementing and evaluating a holistic and community-based participatory approach to reduce household and ambient air pollution in rural village in Malawi, and you're calling it the smokeless village. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Uh, Thank you, Aiden. Um, That project is, (laughs) it's one of the projects that when I look at it now that I'm actually really embedded in it, I see everything that I just spoke about earlier on about the disparities and it's so glaring but to actually answer your question this research project the community-based participatory approach is actually embedded in this bigger project where we are looking at reducing household and ambient air pollution in a rural village in Malawi 
the project is built around the sustainable development goals and the overall aim is to reach the forest behind first. Like how do we bridge this gap that is constantly there between the rich and the poor, the affluent and the low, low socioeconomic people. And the, one of the things that um, is interesting to me about this project is that it feeds into a number of the sustainable development goals. So we'd have goal 13, which is climate action, because when you're you know, um, looking at reducing household hair pollution, you're looking at the fossil fuel, the, you know, the biomass fuel that's been used, which has been associated with climate change. Uh, we're also looking at a sustainable development goal seven, uh, which is affordable, reliable, sustainable, modern energy for all. Because how do you tell people to, <laughs> to stop cooking on, you know, uh, with biomass fuel when they don't have these alternatives available to them just because of who they are or their socioeconomic status? We're also looking at um, simultaneously at these, the SDG five, which is looking at gender equality. Um, if we all look, um, listen to the COP26 that I just finished, everything is about all oh, women is more affected by climate change, you know. So it's interesting that this um, research is looking into all these in addition to this SDG3, which is health and well-being. Uh, because overall, if we look at this, we're looking at the impact of household and ambient separation on the health of these people. So it's like the SDG three sits right there in the puddle of all these other SDGs. And people would ask like, why are we looking at Sub-Saharan African country? That is definitely no brainer. Reports have been showing that by the year 2030, 90% of the world's population without electricity will be from Sub-Saharan African country. And 40% of that population is and will be without clean cooking access by 2040. So if we look at that then, and we, we are planning to bring the forest behind a step closer to the you know, high income country, then it makes sense to look into this society. And that's where we are here in Malawi. We are using this holistic approach to address household and ambient air pollution because it's not a new problem. It's not a new issue. We've been screaming climate change, um, air pollution for over four, four decades. But what we are looking at is we're not just looking at one intervention. We are looking at every intervention that is possible, that is feasible, available, affordable, that is efficient for this community, for them to be able to use. We are looking into behavior change approaches. We are looking into cook stoves. We are looking into warming bags. We are looking into you know, behavior change of them closing the lid of the pot when they are cooking. You know, so that all these things together hopefully will create a more effective outcome or to reduce this issue of household air pollution um, within this um, community. And not just for cooking alone, we're looking at how they are, are eating their home and lightening their home. So like I said, the community-based participatory approach is just another angle that we are looking at because the power needs to belong to the people that we are researching. We can't keep going and saying, this is what you should use. So the, the aim of that CVPR approach is that these community members will co-create this knowledge with us. What works well for them? Yeah, we might be educated. We might have all these research, research, whatever it is, that we are thinking they don't know, but they are the owner of their community. They are the owner of their kitchen. You know, what do they want? How do they want it? When do they want it? So that's the approach that we are looking at. And, um, you know, I've been on the field for the past seven weeks and it's been, you know, high opening that Eunice, you know, absolutely nothing like this people, <laughs> you know, these people are just so willing, so open to, to actually make, have interventions that will make them feel better. So they are not ignorant. Like, you know, the top down approach always thinks these people know what they want and it's, left for this project now to be able to accomplish that um, in this village. So that's an, like a, a tiny interpretation of the project. <laughs> Would you mind sharing a little bit about what has been accomplished so far with the project between research ah. and your field, your field work? Yes. So um, like I said, I've been here since ending of September and we've been able to do a lot of engagement processes. 
So one of the things that we did before we started the field work is to engage the community leaders and explain to them what we wanted to do. And I think that was the, the key to what the achievements that we are seeing now. We were able to tell them, this is what we know, um, but we want to know what you know as well. Um, and after doing that, we started having a series of meetings with the whole village, with the women, with the men separately, because you know there is this idea in our head that if we put them together, there might be friction, the men might, the women might not be able to talk. So we've tried all those angles. We really, there isn't actually that much difference, to be honest, when we had the men together with the women, the women were saying what they wanted to say, the men were saying what they wanted to say as well. But one of the key things that have come out of this village is that household hair pollution is a big issue in the village. Literally every household in that village cooks with biomass fuel. It's majority with a three stone fire and they've been able to assess during the survey and the focus group that, you know, the symptoms that they get, like the watery of the high, um, you know, like excessive um, coughing, there is burns um, in children as well. So they are very open now because we are there to say, this is what we have read in research that works but what do you think? So that's the stage that we are here now. We're actually going to lead them with that idea to think about which of these interventions would suit that particular village. And they would be the decision maker for that and come back to us and say, we've decided this is what we want. And then the project comes in and implements that intervention um, on behalf of the, yeah, for the people in the village. What else? Yeah. Apart from household hair pollution, just like any poor, poor community that, you know, research has been done, there are lots of other issues as well. For instance, there is water issue, there is drought, it's been dry, really, really very dry in Malawi um, since I've been here. So the farmers are complaining, there is, you know, you can, they, they tell you about the poverty level, there is, you know, education, they need schools, you know, there is so much that needs to be done. So the project is looking holistically at household and hand pollution, but we are also listening to these needs because you know when we exit, we are hoping that the capacity of these villages of this community would have been enhanced, that they would be the one to now be calling College of Medicine in, in Malawi or Ireland and saying, you know, uh, we need you guys back here because we want you guys to look into this research for us. And I think that's one of the key outcomes that we are looking for in enhancing the capacity on, of this community, which we are seeing already. I mean, people are really coming up and really interested in what we are doing. We are teaching, you know, um, not using the resources within the community. For instance, we're using the carpenters to build what we needed to measure the um, household air pollution. So we are there for household air pollution. We are also, you know, engaging the community in every other aspect um, of their lives as well. There's no mistaking that the interconnection between individuals, communities, and the environment, and the implications that climate change has on health, especially among the global forest. In your opinion, what could be done to reduce such inequalities? That question actually should have been asked to those uh, leaders that went to COP26. <laughs> But well, thank you. Um, it's actually an excellent question. It is a seriously packed question. But I will attempt to unpack the questions and then try and put it back at the end as to what should be done. So you've talked about individuals who live in some form of communities, which over the years, um, the elite has labeled as rural and urban. Um, these communities are in an environment which is now threatened due to the rapid and uncontrolled climate changes from several factors, such as greediness of the few, mishandling of natural resources, and our desire for this fast and disposable lives. That's what I call the fast food and all these plastics that we use. All these actions, like we all know, have resulted in this heel health, loss of wages, entrenching the rich to be the middle classes, the middle class to be the low classes, the low class to be the poor. And now we are now having a label, the global poorest. Um, I think when I started nursing, I didn't know anything about global forest, but now we now have a term global forest. And if you look at all these different factors, and you look at where did we get it wrong, if we can figure out where we got it wrong, then that's when we can start looking at 
a very sustainable solution to this because all we have done is that we have created a complete circle which include lack of access in case of availability, affordability, and keep widening the health of the people and this gap in, of inequalities. So to me, uh, in a nutshell, one word that of what could be done is honesty. And, and each time I think of this word honesty, you know, it's, it, it, let, me, let me explain it with some examples. <laughs> so the Global Note is promoting, for example, um, composting for apparent reasons. Like if, you, if you're in Ireland, for instance, everybody tells you you have to compost you know, because of climate and human health. But then you come to the global south and interventions that are funded by this same global north are promoting chemical fertilizers to the global south rural farmers. And the farmers are paying for it. So that's one. Or you look at a project that is distributing watering cans for farmland when the nearest water source is like miles away from those farmland. You're thinking, how many trips are you expecting the 86 year old farmer to make for her or him or her to water the farm? And then we tell the rural areas to stop fire with collection, yet there is no electricity or LPG in majority of these communities. How do we expect these people that live on an income of less than $2 a day um, to cover the cost of cleaner source of energy the solution is that if it is not good enough for the rich, then it can never be good enough for the poor. It's, it's just a simple solution. You know, whatever it is that we are implementing in the global north or in the rich communities, that should be replicated in the poor, in what we have now labeled as the global poorest. There has to be a straightforward, honest, transparent intervention processes at all levels not just at the government level, not just at policy level, at individual levels. You know, you as a researcher, you can't be coming into a rural village and you're, you know, you're driving in your, you know, electric cars when you know that that, you know, whatever, that they used to make that battery, the name has eluded me now, is being harvested in, you know, DRC by a four-year-old or by a guy that's only getting paid like less than $3, you know, in a day. You know, we have to be honest about the things that we promote to the global poorest. We can't keep hiding interventions or what is working in Global North in textbooks because we know like there is a literacy issue. There has to be a balance. What works in the Global North must be literally translated to the Global South. There is no, there should be no washy, wishy-washy about projects anymore. No longer sick boxes approach um, or charity walks or anything like that. These people are enlightened people, maybe not as ABC as we know it, but there is no culture, there is no tribe, there is no race that does not have knowledge that has been passed on over the decades. And that should be acknowledged in every intervention that we are looking at if we want to stop this imbalance between climate and health and individual and communities. We need to listen more. I think that's just my, yeah, that's my solution. Thank you for your passion on this subject. It's really great to hear. Um, and before we wrap up, uh, how do you think we as global health professionals could better incorporate the SDGs into our work? To be honest, Megan, everything that we do now is about the SDG. That's what I've told myself now. Like there is nothing that we do that is no longer SDG. It's covered under, you know, when you turn on the light in your room, it's, and you know, it's, you're thinking of SDG when you're washing your mouth and you leave the top running, you you know, you're, there's an SDG in there. I think what needs to be done a little bit more when it comes to global health um, advocates or workers is to create a repo such that you're not the only one that is aware of this. You know, be involved more. And when I say be involved more, I'm not saying spend your whole life 24 hours in global health. But, you know, you meet someone on the road and they just threw that plastic bottle away. Oh, hi, my name is Eunice and I'm a climate, you know, and that bottle can actually be reused. You know that that person might not listen to you, but there is you've already sown a seed in that person. So that that way we are like that boy, that starfish boy. There's a starfish story where the old man was asking the boy, you know, why are you keeping throwing the starfish back into the thing? You can't finish it. And I remember that it says that if it, you know, 
if it's just saving one, you're making a difference. So it's not until you do this big thing. It could be something as small as that. It's actually an act of kindness. The Sustainable Development Goals, to me, is wrapped in kindness. You know, show kindness to somebody. You are improving their mental health. Smile more. You are improving somebody's mental health. That woman you saw on the street that is struggling to feed her child, if you have an extra bond, give it to her. Like, you know, those are SDGs. It's not until we sit on the panel of COP26 or travel around the world. You know, that's to me, that's not making a difference. The difference is in the little things that we do. So that's what I would suggest to you. Um, yeah, the little things. Do more of the little things. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Eunice. It's been an absolutely incredible and fascinating conversation. If you'd like to learn more about the Smokeless Village project, please visit www.thesmokelessvillage.org. If you'd like to learn more about the Irish Global Health Network or the student outreach team, visit www.globalhealth.ie where you can sign up for our newsletters. Thanks so much for tuning in.